and come to you. Because you are the only one who care with such care, they can reach to the very, very depth of our hearts. Father, you care about our hearts, about the stones, the heaviness, about the complications and all the brokenness. Father, thank you that you care for us so much. You gave us your only son. Lord, that through your son, we now have hope. And through your Holy Spirit, we now have a companion to fellowship with. Father God, we ask that as we all come together to seek your face tonight, that you join us together, especially, Lord, those who are new and those who have come to serve, to give their testimony, to release the very, very powerful healing that they have received from you to all of us. Lord, bless them. Bless them greatly to flow from you words that will touch hearts. And that, Lord, many, many, many of us will hand over the stones to you for our own healings. Father, we specially pray for Pastor Simeon. Lord, that as you have used him so powerfully over the years, that tonight, Lord, speak from him the mouth that would release healing truth from you, the mouth that would release kingdom truth that will bring us into your kingdom life. Oh, Father God, we ask that you raise from the refuge a people of your kingdom, a people healed for your kingdom to grow and expand and to reach out and to serve you, to tell the world that they are not forgotten by you. No matter what pain that they, they are going through, that Lord, you would use us to go to them, to remind them, to let them know that you love them and you are powerful to heal them, to set them free. Lord God, join us together in the work of redemption. Join us in a work of kindness and love. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. 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 We'll sing a few simple songs before we get into the word and I must say that last week I really enjoyed the session and I'm blessed by it and I'm really looking forward to the next many weeks. Thank you very much. As the deer panted for the water, so my soul longed after thee. As the deer panted for the water, so my soul longed after thee. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship Thee. You alone are my strength, my shield. You alone may my spirit be. Desire and I long to worship thee. You alone are my strength, my shield. To you 
for the night over to you thank you Host, thank, thank you. you thank you brother richard thank you for leading us into a joyful moment <laughs> yeah, amen hallelujah. once again welcome 
Welcome, everyone. Um, well, um, maybe some of you are new here. And um, once again, warm welcome. And some faces are um, journey with us for quite some time. So, but today I'm going to briefly just run through what is the refuge for those who are new. So how, how we end up today, all right? So allow me to continue to share the screen, yeah. So we started from February this year after, after the pandemic started. And then we have our first uh, February's four weeks of uh, uh, preparations for a generation to dance in the storm. Basically, it's a disaster and crisis preparedness. So we have uh, topics on this uh, preparations for spirit, mental, and physical. Then um, we thought we just end after after one month of so called uh, online conference, but um, unexpectedly it 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 continue to roll on. So we have something that uh, we have our monthly meeting. March, we have one that continue to follow up with those who come in and want to continue to, to learn how to prepare spiritually, mentally, and also physically. So um, we have topics on how to align with God's timing. And then we have um, uh, our one of our speakers who are... Um, <laughs> A servant of God that uh, um, uh, God put him in the logistic uh, management in crisis. So he come in to speak about Joseph 7-7, humanitarian uh, solution. Then in month of uh, June that we have food security where we have uh, Dr. Ting Ho's and some speakers that come on board to share with us about uh, how to how to grow healthy food and how to how to be prepared and how to how to understand uh, Garden of Eden's how God wants us to restore the relationship with Him through farming and growing and mending the soil. So in July, that where this pandemic is dragging on, then we, we, we felt that the mental health is very important. So we have one month of different speakers that come on board to talk about mental well-being and then uh, um, different approach, the Hebrews roots approach and also um, talking about uh, grief support and so on. So then how we, 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 we journey on to this two months, the August and September, where we think this mental health and it relates to the family and the importance of uh, preparations of family and the children, where this um, pandemic and also the challenges, uh, ch challenging times to come, or we as a body of Christ, follower of Christ that understand the end time preparedness so how are we going to prepare as family, as a body, a very primary unit of a community, how to prepare them? So that is where we have uh, uh, our, our beloved speaker, Pastor Sumians on board to not just talk about uh, our families, how, how we're going to prepare, but starting from very individual uh, in, uh, intimate relationship with God, restoring the, the, the relationship with God and then to the family. So that is where um, these pictures that come into picture. So this is also a, 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 a season of um, preparing the false feast in the Hebrews calendar where we know about the feast that uh, emphasized in the Old Testament as well as in the New Testament. So this is how the pictures is. It's a journey for us to prepare the family, individual, children, and a journey that going uphill to the mountain to have this feast of ingathering or it calls a feast of tabernacles or shukot, which is at the end of September. It is just so uh, parallel to his timing that this this uh, these topics that come in together, we're preparing families 
where, where this uh, appointed time of Feast of Tabernacles that we're emphasizing on families that dwell together under one roof with the presence of God. So this is a rehearsal uh, year after years, generations to generations where God, uh, uh, the season and times that understand by his children, where he talked to the Israel, uh, Israelites, where we are the engrafted, uh, engrafted in the believer of Christ. So, um, so this is a uh, this is a uh, scriptures that that is imprinted in our hearts that for for this season, these two months, where Deuteronomy six. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your hearts, with all your soul, with all your strength. This is where God wants us to have the intimate relationship, restore that relationship with him. This commandment that I give you today are to be on your heart and impress them on your children. It doesn't just end on the adult life to understand the scriptures, but it is to impress them on our children as well. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, when you get up, tie them as a symbol on your hands and bind them on your forehead. Write them on the door frame of your houses. So last week we have started with uh, Brother Daniels and families come on board to share to share a story that is under one roof. So this is a this is the pictures that we 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 want to we want to uh, combine and merge during these sessions is that we have a family story time, then we relate to the the message, and then we have a practical time at the end. So it is a story that just now what we mentioned that it is his story. So it is a powerful message, a powerful witness of his goodness and greatness and all, all that he has done from the Old Testament, where the covenant story from Abraham, which uh, Brother Daniels and families have painted last, last week. And it also, it links to a beautiful covenant story, a relationship with God. So it emphasized on hearing and obeying the Lord, which is the righteousness that God wants us to have with him and keeping the commandment, not just an old, old story that we are talking to, to, to children, but it is a life where, where Pastor Humans come on board and, and share about life, te uh, life testimony of ongoing abundant life in the kingdom but encouraging us to really want that abundant life, desire of that abundant life for the first uh, sessions, that the life shining with Jesus Christ in the center, that the abundant life is so important, especially in this season, that so much of mess and chaos out there, the darkness and broken world out there, where the body of Christ needs to have this very core um, Jesus Christ in the center and we can shine for him and be the light and be the sword. So the covenant story continue to flow even to every primary unit family as one, each one under covering and find uh, the narrow path and removing stone, which is today, this is our, our uh, this week topic. All right. So um, that's um, I'm going to I'm just going to share a a, a a short video about the covenant. So where this is a, a, a story time. So every week this story time will build up. Why eventually at the end of the eight weeks there is a shukot the where children families that are going to build up the camp that dwell together. If you've been around Christians, you've probably heard of the idea of having a personal relationship with God, which could mean different things in the Bible, like having God as a friend, or your father, or 
maybe your teacher. But there's one particular way that the Bible talks about this relationship that you find all over. But strangely, we don't talk about it that much. And that's the idea of a partnership with God. A partnership like working alongside someone to accomplish a goal together. Right, and this is actually what you see at the beginning of the Bible. God creates this good world full of all of this potential. And then God appoints these unique creatures, humans, as his partners in bringing more and more goodness out of all that potential. But the humans don't want to partner with God. They rebel and try to create a world on their own terms. And so this broken partnership is the Bible's explanation for why we're stuck in a world of corruption and injustice and the tragedy of death. It's not like there's just one or two humans who have bailed on this relationship. In the story of the Bible, everyone has abandoned the partnership with God. So what God does is select a smaller group of people out of the many, and he makes a new partnership with them called a covenant. And in a covenant, God makes promises, and then in exchange asks his partner to fulfill certain commitments. And the purpose of all of this is to somehow use this covenant relationship to renew his partnership with everybody else. Now, there are actually four times in the Old Testament that we're told God initiates a covenant relationship with Noah, Abraham, the nation of Israel, and King David. And it's through these that God is forming a covenant family into which all people will eventually be invited. So let's see how these work. The first one is with Noah. So in this story, God has just brought the flood to cleanse the world of humanity's corruption. And Noah and his family are the only ones left. And so God makes a covenant with Noah saying, listen, I know that humans will continue to be evil, but despite that, I'm not going to destroy it like this again. Instead, the earth will be this reliable place for us to work together. Great, so what does Noah have to do? Nothing. And that's what's so interesting about this first covenant is that God is promising to be faithful even though he knows humans won't be. The next time we see God make a covenant is with a man named Abraham. God chooses him, promises to bless him, give him a large family, lots of land where they can flourish. And in return, God asks Abraham to trust him and train up his family to do what is right and just. And the whole reason for this covenant is God says that somehow he's going to bring his blessing to all families of the world through this one family. So that's Abraham. The next time we see God make a covenant is when Abraham's family grows into the tribe of Israel. And this covenant is with the whole tribe. God asks them to obey a set of laws, which are these guidelines for living well as a community of God's partners. And if they do this, then God promises to bless them and that they will become a people who then represent him to the rest of humanity. That's the covenant with Israel. The last covenant is with King David. Yeah, the tribe of Israel has become this large nation ruled by David. And God asked David and his descendants to partner with him by leading Israel in obeying the laws and doing what is right and just. And God promises that one day, one of David's sons will come and extend God's kingdom of peace and blessing over all the nations. So those are the four covenants that God makes in order to restore his partnership with the whole world. But here's what happens. Israel breaks the covenant. They worship other gods, they allow horrible injustice, and so they lose their land and are forced off into exile. So it seems hopeless. But during this time, Israel's prophets talked about a day when God would restore these covenants in spite of Israel's failure, somehow. Yeah, they called it the new covenant. And this is actually what's so interesting about Jesus is that he's introduced into this story as the one who fulfills all of these covenant relationships. We're told that he's from the family of Abraham, and so he will bring the blessings of that family to the whole world. We're told that he's the faithful Israelite who was able to truly obey the law. And we're told that he's the king from the line of David, and so he goes about extending God's kingdom of justice and peace to all. And that's really remarkable for one guy. Yeah, and what it highlights is perhaps the most surprising claim of all made about this man, that Jesus is no mere human but rather God become human. And God did this in order to be that faithful covenant partner that we are all made to be, but have failed to be. And so through Jesus, God has opened up a way for anyone to be in a renewed partnership with him. So Jesus calls people to follow him and become part of this new covenant family. And despite their failures, Jesus is committed to making them into partners who were becoming more and more faithful. The story of the Bible ends with a vision of a fully renewed world, 
full of goodness and peace. And there's this renewed humanity there, partnering together with God to expand the goodness of his creation. And so the end of the Bible story is really a new beginning. Hey. So this is this story of the covenant. And I just want to share with, uh, with you this three scriptures. And this is my last slide and I pass the time to Pastor Siomi. So with the covenant story that just now we have shared with you all, so links to what we are going to share um, uh, by, by Pastor Siomi and the team. So Ezekiel 11 verse 18 to 20. I just emphasize on verse 19. I will give you I will give them an undivided heart and put a new spirit in them. And I will remove from them their hearts of stones and give them a heart of flesh. This is a new covenant that when this happens, then they will follow my decree and be careful to keep my law. They will be my people and I will be their God. And Ezekiel 36, 24 to 28 and in verse 26, it mentions that I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh, where I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decree and be careful to keep my laws. It is where promise of God that from, from Old Testament and it the New Testaments that fulfilled by Jesus Christ, the new covenants that we can have that new heart, heart of flesh with his spirit with us. So Jeremiah 31, uh, 31, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel, with the people of Judah. It will not be like a covenant I made with their ancestor when I look, I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they broke my covenant. Though I was, uh, I was a husband to them, declared the Lord, this is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel. After that time, declared the Lord, I will put my law in their minds, write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord for the words. And now um, I'm going to pass the time to Pastor Simeon. And um, I, just, I just want to have a, a brief introduction for those who, who knew joining us this week. Uh, Pastor Simeon uh, was born in Cambodia in 1966, and he moved to US. And then the Lord called him out of, of his uh, secular work into ministry as a pastor of Touch of Family Church in 2007, and where he shepherded for 10 years. And in 2017, he trans, uh, transitions to Red Ministry, so which is releasing and advancing the kingdom ministry, and where he trained the body of Christ to walk in and live out the kingdom that consists of righteousness, peace, joy, love, and power. Okay, I pass the time to you, Pastor Silmian. Thank you. Well, good evening, everyone. I'm so glad to be with you again. Uh, what a special time. I do have people from our RAC ministry joining us, and I will be introducing all of them to you uh, just a little bit later. And uh, But they're all from Malaysia. So I have a team here with joining you today as well. So I'm gonna just share some screen with you. Oop. Um, could you allow me to share screen? And uh, so I'll wait for that to happen. And let's see, there Are we go. Exciting? Yes. Okay, so this is our session number two. And I do want to recap what we had talked about last week. Uh, according to the Bible, Jesus wants to give you and I an abundant life. Now, this is a very interesting 
verse in the Bible, because Jesus said the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I've come that they might have life and have it abundantly. The question is, what is abundant life? What would be abundant life for you and me? And, you know, as we were asking that question, a few of you answered, well, it's the peace that we have. We don't have the worries in our life. It's the joy. It's the love in the relationship. It's the righteousness. It's, it's us being able to obey God. And it's the power for us to overcome certain things. But that power has a great purpose in our life. It's being able to accomplish what it is that God has for us. I remember I used to work in the aerospace industry here in the U.S. And I would be asking people at my workplace. I asked engineers. I asked managers. I asked secretaries. And all of them said the same thing here in America. It's when we can have the peace and the joy and the great relationship in our lives. And none of them said money. You know, they didn't, none of them said money. See, if we have money and we have peace, love, and joy, and we have a great purpose, then yes, of course, that would be an abundant life, but we can have the love, peace, and joy and a greater purpose in our life, even without money. This is what abundant life is for most people. Now, if we truly can have the, that, you know, the Bible also called that the kingdom life, but if you and I can really have that, what would our life look like? What would it look like in our marriage? What would it look like in our family? What would it look like in our life? Well, Jesus said, you and I can have it. And then he said that there are two paths in life. He said in Matthew 7, there's a wide path that leads to destruction, and many will walk in it. And then there's a narrow path that leads to life, but only a few find it. And there's a choice. You and I can choose that path. See, the very interesting thing about that passage is this. It's that the path is wide and many people walk in it. That means a high percentage of the people are choosing that. But the interesting thing is most people will accept what the majority are doing. So if we hear that most marriages will be hard and challenging, then we, if we are going through some challenging times in our marriage, we say, well, that's just part of life because everybody's struggling with it. If we hear that relationship with our teenagers are very challenging, oh, the teenagers won't listen to me. They will rebel against me, all of these things. And if we hear so many people saying how hard it is, then we accept it. But I, you know, one of my, things is that I say, I don't accept people's experiences and make it my reality when it goes against the word of God. The word of God said, I can live this narrow life and it leads to this abundant life, this kingdom life. So even if most people's marriages are bad, I said, wait a minute, my marriage doesn't have to be bad. Even if most people struggle with teenage, I don't have to struggle with teenage. I need to Figure out what the Bible say. The Bible said, I can raise up teenagers, they are, and, and children, and they can be like arrows, you know, in the hands of warriors, and we can do great things. They can do great things for Jesus. The question is, how do I get there? So that's our next question. What's the key factor in determining which path we take? And according to the Bible, it's what's in our heart. The Bible said in Luke 6, 45, whatever in our heart, if it's good in our heart, in a man's heart, we will speak out the good. If there's evil in our heart, we'll speak out the evil. What in our mouth will speak out what our heart is full of. So if we have anger in our heart, we're going to speak out anger. If we have love, we'll speak out love. But then it also says this, Proverbs 4, 23. 
it says that out, you know, be careful to guard your heart because whatever you have in your heart, you will do it. Whatever you have in your heart, it will determine the course of your life. It will determine which path we take. See, if our hearts can be filled with, if it's filled with negative things, we will do those negative things. You know, Dr. Grace had just read out from Ezekiel 36, and God was telling Ezekiel that the Israelites' hearts can be full with stones. He wants to remove the hearts of stones and give us a heart of flesh, a heart of life. And we also look, according to the Bible, what those stones are. The stones can be our negative emotion, it can be our sins, or it can be our lies that we believe in. Think about this. If you and I, if our family, if our loved ones have these stones in their heart, how would they live their life? If we have anger, if we have fear, if we have anxiety and depression and hate and shame, if we have sins in our heart, if we have addiction issues, we have pride and judgmental spirit, if we worship other gods, if money is an idol, if our family is an idol, if our hobby is an idol, how would we live our life? And if we believe in certain lies, because the devil is the father of all lies, if we believe that we're worthless, we're not good enough, we're usually, how do we live our lives? Do you think it's easy to have peace and joy when we have hate and anxiety? No, 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 it's very hard. Do you think it's easy for us to choose the narrow path when we have so much fear and sin in our lives? Is it easy to obey the Lord when we feel like we're so worthless and useless? It's very difficult, very difficult. That's why most people struggle with it. Do you know, I work with many marriages and before we see marriage restored, we get rid of these stones. I help them get rid of the stones. Once the stones are removed, it's so easy for the marriage to be restored. It's so easy to help people live the life that God has for them. Once they're walking in the peace, the joy, the love, they're walking in the presence of God, it's so much easier for us to obey the Lord. But if you have these things in your heart, it will determine the course of your life, and the course is usually the wider path. All right, let me see. But it's easy for us to see that. You think about it. If we have these stones, how does it impact our lives? How does it impact our relationship with our spouse, with our children, with our parents? You know, my mom broke her kneecap a couple of weeks ago. And my wife, Kay, as you saw in, you know, in some of the photos last week, my wife has been the main caretaker for my mom. So this, my mom would be my wife's step uh, mother-in-law. And in America, we have so many bad mother-in-law jokes because the impression is this, is that it is so hard to have a good relationship with your mother-in-law especially if you're the wife. So Kay has been living, staying in the same room, sleeping with my mom, helping her because she couldn't move. So helping her go to the restroom, waking up at nighttime at 2 a.m., at 4 a.m., helping with the meals. And she, she had done that for about eight days until she had her surgery. And now we move my mom here with us. My mom is 81. After eight, nine days straight, 24, seven. You would think that the relationship would be strained, that the relationship would be suffering, that they would be frustrated and angry with one another. But do you know something very interesting? After eight, nine days, my mom was sitting on her couch just kind of petting Kay's arm 
And she looks at Kay and she said, Kay, I love you so much. And then I asked Kay, Kay, how's your really, how do you feel about the last eight, nine days? She said, it was so special. I got to know Ma so much better and, and I really appreciate her. So, so I'm telling people, I'm teaching people the relationship that we have. We don't have to take the wide road. 99%, I, you know, whether it's 90% or 99% or whatever the percentage is, said, ah, relationship with mother-in-law will be tough. Relationship with your spouse will be difficult. Relationship with your children, teaching. I said, no, 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 no. I'm not going to accept people's experiences and make it my reality. I'm not going to accept it. I am going to go after what the Bible say. Jesus said, you and I can have abundant life. That means we can have an abundant marriage. That means we can have an abundant family. That means we can have abundant relationship. The question is, do you want it? Do we want it? Well, if so, we need to remove these stones. Because if we get rid of this junk from our lives, then it's so much easier to live in peace and joy and love and righteousness and obeying the Lord and have a greater purpose with the power that God wants to give us. So the first question that I usually ask people, what kind of life do you want? What kind of marriage, what kind of family do you want? What kind of life do you want for your children? Well, if you want this abundant kingdom life, then we are going to talk about how to remove the stones. Now, I'm not going to give you the full teaching on removing the stone. It usually takes a full day. So I'm going to give you a quick summary of it because it's only about a 40 minute summary. And then I want to introduce to you our RAC ministry team from Malaysia as well. So we said these stones are this negative emotion. And last week we had looked at some scripture verses that talk about the stones. Here's something very interesting. When you and I are struggling with these kind of stones, the negative emotion like anger or fear, for example, usually people are taught on how to manage these things, how to deal with these things, but by managing it. Let me give you an example. When I was working for NASA, I had a female coworker who got very angry with another lady at work. She was so angry, she took her high heel and she started beating up on her, the coworker. Now, if you own the company and this company was like 10,000 employees, you get a little bit nervous. You, you would be thinking, we can't let everybody, all the ladies, bring the high heel and, you know, start beating up other ladies. So what did they do? They brought in an anger management class. So in the anger management class, which all the employees, the 10,000 employees have to attend, guess what they taught us? They taught us how to manage your anger. So they give you some techniques. When you get angry, what you need to do is Breathe slowly. Like, oh, I'm so angry. <sighs> Just breathe slowly. And then they teach you to count backward from 10 to 1. So you breathe slowly and then you count. <sighs> 10. I'm so angry. <sighs> 9. <sighs> 8. Does it help? Temporarily? Why? Because when you see the person again, or if they act a certain way again, if they say the same thing again, you blow back up again. Why would we do that? Because the anger is still in our heart. And remember, whatever's in our heart, we're going to say it. Whatever's in our heart, we're going to do it. Because it's going to determine if a person has the anger in their heart, it, they will explode again. And sometimes we use expressions like, well, he's just an angry person. It's not because he was born an angry person. 
It's because he let the anger stay in his heart. And whatever you and I have in our heart, it is going to come out. That's why sometimes we use this expression, he is such a loving, or she is such a loving person. It's whatever's in our heart. Or sometimes people say this, well, when they were a little girl, when she was a little girl, she was so loving, but she's changed now. Why would a loving girl change to be no longer loving? Because this little girl learned that if I am loving to people, people hurt me and I can't be loving anymore. And, and they start letting these things in their heart. And whatever's in their heart will produce that fruit in their lives. But here's the interesting thing. The world teaches us that we need to manage our anger. But God tells us that we should manage our anger. We should get rid of our anger. And also the Bible teaches us the effect of anger. And I'm going to explain that to you. So let's look at that. Ephesians 4. 26, 27, it said, in your anger, do not sin. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry and do not give the devil a foothold. You probably have seen this verse, these verses before, but have you ever thought what it means by giving the devil a foothold? If you and I go to bed angry, we will give the devil a foothold. What does that mean? And by the way, almost 100% of us have one point in our lives gone to sleep angry. No matter what kind of relationship, you know, Kay and I, be honest with you, we have an amazing relationship. I tell people, if you look at my heart today, you can still see fireworks. It goes boom, 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 boom. It's still alive and doing really well. But in our 805 days of marriage, it's still, we've had times when I've been angry with her when she's been angry with me. But we try not to go to sleep with that anger. Because it said it will give the devil a foothold. What does it mean to give a devil a foothold? Think about this. When people are angry. Now, I'm not talking about you. I know you guys are all strong in the Lord, and you probably don't have to deal with anger much anymore. But let's talk about other people. When they get angry, even Christians, what do they think about when they're angry? What do people normally think about when they get angry? Well, I know in America what they think about because I talk to a lot of people in America and this is what they will tell me. They said, well, sometimes when I get so angry, I want to take revenge on them. Sometimes People think this, well, you hurt me, well, I'm going to hurt you back. Well, I'm so angry with you, I don't ever want to talk to you again. I'm so angry with this person, well, I'm not cooking for them tonight. Actually, one Malaysian mother said this, and by the way, you know, if you're a good cook and you're not going to cook for your spouse that night, well, your spouse is going to suffer, right? I was talking to one lady in Malaysia who have some children. She said, I'm so angry with my mother-in-law, she'll never see my kids again. And these are Christians. By the way, where do those thoughts come from? Where do those thoughts come from? Is it from God? Of course not. It's from the devil. Why do we have those thoughts? Because we've given the devil a foothold. 
We open the door for the devil to come into our heart with our anger. When you and I hold on to anger, it impacts how we see things, how we view things, how we look at people. If you're angry at your spouse, all you can think about is all of the negative things they have done. Let me share a personal story with you. Kay and I have been courting for 10 months. And if you remember the story, it only took me 10 minutes to know that she would be my wife. After 10 minutes, I asked her pastor if I can court her with the intention of marrying her. This is 10 minutes of talking to her. And I just knew. And we had a courtship. I came to America. She was in um, Japan. And we were courting for 10 whole months. It was such a beautiful time. I mean, every single day, I would talk to her for one to three hours a day by video. And I started off using this little phone. And I would see her through WhatsApp. And, after a week of this, I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. I upgraded to my laptop because I could get more of her. And for 10 straight months, things were going so well until we had our first argument. And the argument was about the wedding that she was preparing for. See, I'm really good with money. I don't spend much money. My first wedding She's my second wife. My first wedding, I spent 3,000 US dollars, okay? And it was a beautiful wedding. We had about 500 people at that wedding. And I spent $3,000. It was incredible. So I'm really good with money. I don't spend much. So I'm talking to Kay and I say, Kay, you know, I think our budget should be 5,000 US dollars, okay? Now, to me, that's a lot of money, but for a Japanese and in the wedding culture in Japan, that's very little money. Because we started looking around for hotels because we were expecting about 130 and most in the churches in the church that she was at was small. It didn't have the space for that. So we started looking for hotels. We found out in Japan. We were looking for the average cost hotel to host our wedding. Well, the hotels was 400 dollars, US dollars per person. Do you know what that means? That means we can invite 12 people to our wedding. And so she sent me an Excel file of a breakdown of the, um, the, uh, the cost and it was about 20,000 US dollars. And when I looked at that, I said, Oh my, that's a little bit high because I'm thinking 5,000 and it's 20,000. I said, That's a little bit high. Now we only had this was January, the wedding was in June, and she hasn't sent out the invitation. She was getting a little bit stressed. We had people coming from out of the country, and she made this statement. She said, Well, Simeon. You don't understand the Japanese culture. Maybe you should marry a Japanese woman. Do you know what I heard? What I heard was this. I said, wait, 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 wait. We're not even married and you already want to divorce me? What's going on here? So this was our first argument. I got upset with her. She got upset with me. And remember for 10 straight months, by the way, I didn't start courting her because of love. I mean, I didn't look at her for 10 minutes and all of a sudden, oh, I love Kay so much, I wanna marry her. I just knew she would be the one for me based on the requirements that I asked the Lord for and she met those requirements. But for 10 straight months, as I've talked to her, one, two hours a day, there was a day when we talked over three hours, every day, every day she became more and more beautiful to me. But that one day, our first argument, okay, I'm ashamed to say this, but when I looked at her on the laptop, I said, Kay, you don't look beautiful anymore. 
But you know, Kay is such an amazing lady. Amazing lady. Because we dealt with it. See, I was in Malaysia that night, actually. And, um, and she was in Japan. I wasn't in the US. I was in Malaysia. And I, and I remembered. We dealt with it that night. We said, okay, let's get rid of this anger. But the next day, the next night when we were talking again, she was good. All the anger in her heart was gone. But I was still disappointed and angry. I kept thinking, what does she mean? I don't understand Japanese woman. Why does she want to? I, I felt like she already wanted to divorce me. And Kay is such an amazing lady. You know what she said? She said, Simeon, you take your time. Take your time. Process this. You know, when she said that, the Lord reminded me of a verse in the Bible. Husband, love your wife as Christ loved the church. And I was thinking, I said, Lord, I'm not loving Kay like that. Lord, I want that. And all of a sudden, the anger was gone from my heart. And I look at Kay in that laptop. I said, oh my, so beautiful again. Do you know why I share that with you? It's because when you and I hold anger in our heart, it will alter how we see things. We will see things from a devil perspective. I mean, think about this. How many of you who have been so angry would say, I'm so angry, praise God, hallelujah. I'm so glad he's given me this anger because he's got great things for me. No, 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 no. We don't do that. The devil has a foothold. So this is what it means. See, the anger causes us to hear from the devil and makes it very difficult for us to hear from God. The world will teach us we need to manage our anger, but the Bible say, get rid of all your bitterness, rage, and anger. But now you must also rid yourself of all such things as these anger, rage, hate, malice, slander, and filthy languages from your lips. So the Bible then say, manage your anger. This is what the world teaches. But they say, get rid of it. But you know, there's a problem. The problem is it doesn't tell us how to get rid of anger. God didn't tell us how. But the good news is this, if God tells us in multiple instances to do something and he doesn't tell us how, it means there are multiple ways to do it. And in the removing the stone training, we teach people one way to do it. And during our practice, the breakout session, the facilitator will teach you a very simple way on how to get rid of anger. Okay. And like I said, I'm not going to do the, the whole teaching on this. It's just a quick summary for you. Well, some people will say, well, I've already forgiven that person but I can't forget what they've done. That's not complete healing. Many people have gone through ministry and they've gotten rid of the, the unforgiveness, but they will say, I can forgive, but I can't forget. And a lot of people have said that. That's not true healing. Why? Because when they think back to the past memory of the hurt that they had or the anger that they had, in that past memory, they can still remember the anger. They can still feel it, or they can still feel the hurt. Like a lady that has been sexually abused, when she thinks back to the time of the abuse, oh, the fear, the hurt, the pain, the anger, the hate, still there in the memory. In the Removing the Stone training, we teach people how to get rid of the anger, not only from the present, but also from the past. So when you go back to the past memory, the memory should be healed up. It should be either neutral or peaceful or positive. Even with ladies who have been sexually abused. You said, how is that possible? Well, 
because Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He can heal us, not only today, but yesterday as well. And that's what we have seen with so many of the people that we work with. So the solution is to get rid of anger. And by the way, it will impact our whole family. I remember I was at a church in Malaysia and a lady, you know, she was involved in worship. One of the worship leader at her church, she volunteered for a demonstration and she confessed. She said, I've been angry with my 14 year old daughter. And I don't know why, but I keep blowing up with her. And it's been like that for the last several years. I cannot go through a week without being angry with her. And very quickly, she got rid of that anger. She volunteered for a demonstration. She got rid of it. The very next day, she told me, wow, I can't believe it. I wasn't angry with her at all today, the whole day. After about four days of training, at the end of the, the fourth day, or the end of our, our training, she asked if she can give a testimony. She said it was so incredible. This is the first time she's gone four days without being angry with her daughter. It's been a long time, she said. As a matter of fact, when I came back to Houston, she and her husband, they texted me and they said it's been incredible. God has transformed their family. They have so much peace, so much joy. It's been a couple of months and they haven't been angry with one another and the relationship have improved. Even their younger autistic son, oh, I think their son was maybe 13 or 14 and the daughter might have been 16. And the whole family started ministering to people. They not only had more peace and joy and love in their life, they were able to live their life with a greater purpose and be able to minister to people. Now, when we talk about anger, there are different expressions of anger and they have different weight. I don't know if you know this, but our negative emotions have different weight. That's why we can say, I'm a little bit angry at this person. I'm very angry at this person. They all have different weight. Fear have different weight. That's why Proverbs 12, 25 tells us anxiety weights down the heart. They're like stones, they're heavy. So the different weight for anger could be, well, I'm disappointed, I'm frustrated, I'm angry, I'm mad, I'm upset, I'm hurt, I hate. They're all the same expression of anger, but they come with different weight. Now, disappointment is a lot lighter than the hatred, by the way. Different weight. Depression, believe it or not, is a form of anger. It's just anger turns inward. So I have good news for you. When you learn to get rid of anger, it's the same thing as getting rid of disappointment. It's the same thing as getting rid of hate. It's the same thing as getting rid of depression. So the world teaches us that it takes a long time to manage a person's depression. And by the way, that is a true statement. It takes a long time to manage depression. Do you know why? Because if you're managing it, it keeps coming back up. So it takes a long time to heal depression if you're managing it. But what if? What if you can get rid of it? Like you can get rid of anger. Is it even possible? What if I were to tell you it is very possible. Let me give you an example. I was in Hong Kong teaching at this church. At the end, they asked me to be in, get up to the front. And they asked for me to pray for people. I actually had my two children with me at that time. And uh, let me see, how old were they? They were pretty young. I'm guessing maybe 12, 13, something like that. And so I had my children with me and I said, okay, children, you come up, you pray for people too. So they have adults coming up and my two kids were praying for uh, some of the adults that were lining up and we had people lined up 
on my line, on their line, and I'm praying for them. And we had this young lady, I'm assuming she's maybe in her 30s. I didn't ask, but she looked like she could have been in her 30s. And she came up to me and she was just crying, cried, cried, cried. So my first question for her, are you angry with anyone? She said, yes, I'm angry with my uncle because he had sexually abused her. I said, do you want to let go of the anger? She said, yes. So I taught her a very simple prayer. It took less than two minutes. She went from, I am so depressed. I am crying. I am weeping. I've been hurt for most of my life, ever since I was a little girl, to she had such a beautiful smile, a beautiful smile. And she said, the Lord showed me. He was there. And she gave her anger and her to the Lord. And she went from, I'm so depressed, with such a beautiful smile, she said, I'm no longer depressed. It took two minutes. And you know, last week we had someone asked about grief. The Burkitts had asked about grief. And I said I would touch on it briefly. What if I were to tell you that it doesn't take long to let go of grief? It doesn't have to. Now, we do need a time to grieve. But see, the world tells us this. They, the world tells us. You take as long as you need. Everybody's different. If you need two years, you take two years. If you need three years, you take three years. Take all the time you need. But you know, in the Bible, um, the Israelite, when they grieve, they grieve for one month, and that's it. But what if I tell you, you can let go of the grief pretty easily. In the same way that you let go of anger, you can let go of the grief and the hurt. How do I know? because I help people let go of grief. I didn't realize it back then when I was teaching about anger that you can do the same thing with grief. So one of the first lady that I had prayed for, she's a mother, the, the, the son pastor a church of about a thousand people. So I was doing training for this group. And, uh, and they asked if I can pray for the mother. The mother has been depressed for six months because her husband had died six months prior. And she's been depressed and she's been grieving. So she volunteered for the demonstration. And in front of people, she let go of the anger very quickly. We're talking about a few minutes time. And everybody was so shocked. And I went back to Hong Kong again. You know, about six months later, she said, ah, I've been doing so well. I went back again a year later, two years later, no grief. She had so much joy. Every time I go, she always wanted to say hello to me and had such a beautiful countenance on her face because all of the grief was gone. Sometimes we hold on to grief for six months, for a year, for two years, and we're so depressed and it hurts us. If it's hurting us, we should not be holding on to grief. We can get rid of it very easily. The same thing with fear. God doesn't want you and I to hold on to fear. That's why he tells us in 1 Peter 5, 7, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. By the way, I don't know if you know this, but anxiety is fear. When people have panic attack, it's just bad fear. When people have obsessive compulsive disorder, it's fear. When people have insomnia and they can't go to sleep at night, the primary reason it's fear. They're afraid of something. When people have recurrent bad dreams or being chased or something bad's going to happen, and it's recurrent, it's fear. What if I were to tell you, you get rid of the fear, you no longer have to have bad dreams? What if you can get rid of fear, you no longer have to have insomnia? How do I know? Because I work with these people, and I tell people, you can get rid of fear, usually in less than a minute's time. Usually, there are some cases where people take longer. And in my training, I'll explain that. But like I said, I'm giving you a summary today. So, so I was in Los Angeles 
and there was a psychiatrist. This psychiatrist had a lot of fear. She had insomnia. As a matter of fact, she has two degrees in psychiatry. And, but she had insomnia. She had a hard time sleeping. And it's been like that for several months. So she's gone to see other psychiatrists and it's not working. So they asked me to pray for her. Her husband did. I went out to dinner. I got introduced to them that night after dinner. We went and prayed for her. And just like that, she got rid of fear. This was a Friday night. And then on Sunday, I saw them again. And, and she said, she talked to the pastor, can I give a testimony? She gave a testimony. She said, I've been trying to get rid of my fear for a long time, for months. And he said, in less than two hours time, she not only got rid of the fear, she got rid of so many other things. She said, the last two nights, I've been having some beautiful rest. So if you're having insomnia, most of the time it's due to fear. You get rid of the fear, you will be able to sleep like a baby. How do I know? I work with insomnia people and they can sleep very well, usually after one prayer session. Because fears can only come in one of three ways. It's something we experience, something we see, something we hear. Usually, fear only comes one of three ways. And then there's another stone, is the belief in the lies. And one of the major lies that the devil uses is that you and I are not good enough, that we're worthless. They were useless. See, people say it takes a long time to deal with depression, to deal with homosexuality, to deal with anorexia, to deal with marriage problem, to deal with addiction like alcohol, drugs. And that is true if you deal with the symptoms. Very true. Because if you deal with the symptom, and you know, some of you are doctors or doctors to be, and you understand if you deal with the symptoms, it takes a long time. But if you can discover what the roots are, and you deal with the root, it's very easy. It takes much quicker time. Like one of the root cause for depression, and one of the root cause for the problems we have in the world is the lie that we believe that we're not good enough. So what, what would this look like? Oh, poor me, I'm not good enough. Nobody loves me. I am so depressed. So I run to antidepressant. Oh, poor me, people, nobody loves me. So we live our life with the spirit of rejection. Two little girls walking down the street. One girl, two story, was playing with the other girl. She put her fingers, her hands around the other girl's wrist. Oh, you must be fat or something because I can't put my fingers around your wrist. The second girl became anorexic because she believed she was not good enough that she was too fat. A boy growing up, dad said, how come you can't be like the other boys? How come no girls like you? Becomes homosexual. In Malaysia, I prayed for a female pastor who dressed like a man. Why? Because growing up, her parents always wanted a boy. And she felt as a girl, she was not good enough. One doctor, medical doctor, when he was a little boy, they would pick team to play on the kickball. And he would always be the last person picked. And he said, I show you I'm good enough. He ran to performance. So if you try to deal with the symptoms and you don't deal with the root cause of them feeling not good enough, it's going to take a long time. Because that root is still there. That's why if you understand what the root causes are, and you can deal with it at that level, then it's not hard at all. The root causes are these stones in our heart. 
the negative emotions, the sins, and the lies. Those are the root causes. But I want to show you this other picture here and explain to you the order of how to deal with these things. Now, I didn't teach you how to get rid of anger, and we'll do that in a breakout session, and our team will help you. And also do keep in mind, this is not a full training. It's only a summary, okay? So I'm not training you how to do this, and I just don't want to. to we just don't have the time for it today. It takes the whole day, okay? But there's the negative emotion, the sins and the lies. These are the stones, but they make up the root cause of the problems we have in our lives. If you can get rid of these things from our heart, the negative emotion, the sins and the lies, a person will be freed up. Because when you get rid of the lie, we walk in truth. The person no longer see themselves as worthless or useless. They no longer have the anger and the hurt and the shame, and the fear, and the hate, the anxiety, they no longer have to be guilty of the sins because there's no condemnation. The Lord forgave them. Oh, yes, we all sins. We all have some junk. But there's an order to this. The negative emotion is like the padlock. The sin is like the chain, and the lies that we believe in is inside this box. If a person believe in a lie that they're not good enough and you tell them, oh, you are good enough. Jesus loves you. Jesus died for you. You're worth it. That you're the apple of his eyes. You're fearfully and wonderfully made. They can't accept it when they have all the hurt and the sin bounding them, bounding those lies. The majority of the people cannot accept the truth when you tell them. Majority. Over 90% of the people cannot accept it. A small percentage can, but extremely few. Most people can't. And the reason being is because they have the sin, the chain, and the negative emotion, the hurt and pain. But if you can help them unlock the padlock, get rid of the negative emotion first, and then you deal with the sin, then it's very easy for them to accept the truth because the box will be open. Now, let me explain something. Um, most people teach in churches all around the world, they teach that if you meet a person who is sinning, you want to deal with the sin first. Like, for example, homosexuality, we know as Christian it's a sin, but now some Christians are accepting it and they're saying it's not a sin. But whether that or adultery, you know, fornication, so sexual sin, let's talk about that. Let's say you meet someone and they're having some sort of sexual sin and you bring it to church and, and, and then someone says, well, do you know adultery? Do you know homosexuality? That's a sin. You need to confess that sin. If you confess that sin, you can have life with Jesus. Now, it sounds right, but there's a problem. The problem is this, in the Bible, which group of people like to deal with sin first? Did Jesus deal with sin first? No. No, no, no. The Pharisees like to deal with sin first. Think about it. Jesus, this lady, we caught her in the act of adultery. She's a sinner. Let's stone her. Jesus, don't you know this lady that's washing your feet? She is such a sinner. Don't you know how bad of a sinner she is? Disciple, disciple, you look at your master. Why is he always with sinners? The Pharisees like to deal with sin first. Did Jesus deal with sin? Yes, but only after he dealt with their hurt and negative emotion, after he healed them. After he healed the lady caught in adultery, then he said, go and sin no more. He did the same thing with Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was so rejected. You know, he could have looked at Zacchaeus up on that sycamore tree and say, Zacchaeus, you know, you're such a sinner. You stole from your own people. You cheated. You worked with the enemy, the Romans. If you confess your sin, Zacchaeus, you can live eternal life with me. You can have a great abundant life, Zacchaeus. But he did. 
He said, Zacchaeus, today I must be in your home and eat with you. Zacchaeus ran down the tree. He was so excited. Why would be why would Zacchaeus be so excited? Because everybody rejects him. Nobody wants to go to his house. The Jews didn't want to. Nobody loved him. But Jesus loved him and healed his hurt. And then Zacchaeus dealt with his sin. You see, the order makes a big difference. So we teach people how to deal with the, the, the proper order, get rid of the negative emotion, then we can confess our sin, then we deal with our sin, and then we take the lies to the Lord. All right, now I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I have just three quick testimonies for you. And uh, from our team, and I have, I forget how many people, six or seven people uh, who are part of our team there in Malaysia, and they pray for people. We have a couple of pastors, Pastor David Wong, Pastor Zach, and, and Pastor Phoebe, his wife, Dan Panan, Pastor David Wong is in Malaysia, in uh, KL. We have Ryan and Janet. Um, Ryan and Janet are in KL. Pauline is in Kuching. Dax is, Dax is also in KL. And Yip May is also in KL. And so, um, and Pastor Zach and Phoebe, they have a couple of sons, but one of the sons is 15 year old Zach, uh, 15 year old Sean. And he's joining us as well. And um, so, all of them are have learned. Um, Pastor David Wong has been training many other people in this, and and uh, he's raised up a number of people. Pauline has done such a tremendous job along with Yip May, and um, Ryan and, and Janet, they're a couple that I met who were struggling in their relationship. They were dating, and the Lord healed it very quickly, and um, they're wanting to get married. They asked for me to marry them one day, and we were planning it last summer, but COVID prevented that. So they're waiting. And uh, and Dex, you know, as well, that the Lord's been doing some wonderful thing in Dex's life. Okay, so I want to ask, um, I'm going to start out with Sean. He's 15 years old. And the reason I want to start out with Sean is because, you know, number one, he is the youngest. Okay, he's 15. And last week that I prayed for him and he's a pastor's son and I prayed with him last week and um, and Sean so can you share maybe a minute or two you know the prayer session that we had maybe a week or two ago and how that has impacted you uh, thank you pastor uh, can everyone hear me okay uh, so hello everyone my name is Sean and uh, today I will share about what happened uh, during the session with uh, Pastor. So that day, Pastor helped me to do the removing of stone. And uh, God showed to me uh, pictures and uh, visions that are really positive and uh, quite straightforward. I want to thank God that he helped me to change my perspective to look at things uh, with my family members and be more patient with them. God also gave me the peace that helped improve the communication and relationship with my family. Yeah, that's all for, yeah. Guys, um, I don't know if you heard what Sean said. He's 15. What if all 15 year olds can say that? That God gave me more peace. I hear from the Lord, and He gives me ways and patience on how to communicate and work with my family members much better. Wow. Okay. I'm going to move on with uh, Ryan and Janet. So, Ryan and Janet, um, I met them a few years ago. Okay. I don't know who wants to go first, whether it's Ryan or Janet or both at the same time, but I'll leave it up to you guys. Hi, my name is Ryan. So my better half is Janet. 
So um, she invited me for this uh, praying because we have a struggle with our relationship. And yeah, during the praying, um, I found out I'm um, very insecure and not good enough. So I'm very sensitive to people saying that I'm critical criticize me and anything so but God showed me that I'm good enough I'm every day getting better and getting closer to God yeah so that's my sharing hi everyone my name is Janet um yeah so me and Ryan we started our relationship with I would say that from one to ten, our relationship stays at two. It was so bad to the extent that we, we, yeah, we argue a lot. You know, other than uh, arguments, uh, we have like you know, uh, anger and hatred, which includes involve our family members as well. So after the uh, removing stones, instantly, and we realized that both of us agree, and we came to a conclusion that we are at the number eight uh, rate uh, after removing stones. Yeah, so there on, of course, we still face, uh, you know, challenges, but um, it was so different because um, we know how to deal with it. We do not really like keep our anger overnight. That's how our relationship gets better and better. Yeah, thanks, Pastor. Thank you, Ryan and Janet. You know, Ryan and Janet also had shared with me that their, their dating time was so bad that people in their church, you know, from their cell group leaders to the pastors and the pastor's wife and every person said, you guys need to break up. This will never work out. It was that bad. Every person, every leaders, but the Lord restored it pretty quickly. And they have a wonderful, they went from a two to an eight out of a 10 scale. That is extremely wonderful. All right. And it didn't take that long, actually. Okay, I want to move to Pauline. And uh, <clears throat> Pauline's in Kuchi. And I just wanted her to share a, a testimony about what happened with her husband. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, yeah, this is quite an <laughs> unusual kind of testimony here. My husband of, uh, well, he is now 54. Okay. It was uh, only about three years ago that he actually lost his fear of cockroaches. For all his life, he had an intense phobia of roaches. Okay, um, and I find it is so interesting because even Pastor Simeon asked me, he remembers it so well, you know, because normally grown men would not be afraid of cockroaches. But uh, yes, so my husband had that ever since he was very young. He, they, they came from, they, uh, from a humble family. So he had, you know, their living quarters and all that. I mean, basically, you know, living in the shop, um, they, the father had a business, so they lived in the shop and they worked in the shop and, you, you know, with all the stock and all those things, you get roaches everywhere. So he said he used to have see roaches everywhere. And that gave him so much fear that, um, that it, it, it just paralyzes him each time he sees one or smells one. So his fear is so intense that sometimes he would just go, there's a cockroach somewhere. And I'm like, where, 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 you know, he can just sense it and smell it. I, I, I just had no, no idea how that was possible. Um, and he tried many ways to try and get rid of that fear. Uh, but it was actually through one of these removing the stones um, uh, prayer. Um, in fact, it was um, after a, a few times, um, uh, he had dealt with other issues as well. But um, he, he went, he, he had this uh, a prayer to ask the Lord to deliver him of that. It was a very emotional time. It wasn't easy. But he saw the Lord just taking that fear and taking away all those things that he was fearful of, a bag full of them. And, he, and, and, and that was done. But in order to confirm it, 
what we did was with a good friend of ours who knew that, that he has this fear, we drove up, drove out to our kopitiam outside near our house. It was at night when it would happen. And we went to look for cockroaches to see whether he would be, he still had that fear. But strangely, we couldn't find any that night. So, so we went home, we were, we were like going, oh, we weren't sure. But um, we tried that again. Um, uh, I think it was like a couple of days later and it was confirmed because what happened was that he saw a dead cockroach on the floor. In the past, he would just walk past really far, okay? But what he did was that he actually went near it and looked at it, okay? And another time uh, when he was with his mother, a cockroach just kind of ran from the kind of the side of the drain towards her, his mother's feet. And instinctively, he stepped, tried to step on it. Now, that would never have happened. And I can vouch for that. I've been married to him for almost 30 years now. So I can, I can tell you because I was always the roach killer. So really, hallelujah. I mean, I'm just so glad because I don't have to worry about that anymore. And strangely, after that, we seldom see, saw any uh, cockroaches. Yeah, anyway. Yeah, so that's, that's my testimony. Yeah. Thank you so much, Pauline. Um, so, you know, it, the story sounds kind of funny, but I remember when he posted it on Facebook and he sent me a photo of him giving a testimony because he's when he said, I don't have to spend money on psychiatrists and things anymore because it was pretty intense, not a phobia for him. Um, but we're not talking about just a fear of cockroach, but we're talking about any fear. What if you can get rid of the fear of the future, the fear of dying, the fear of ghosts, the fear of um, rejection, the fear of being abandoned, the fear of not having enough money? And what if it doesn't take that long? You know, usually, usually, people can get rid of the fear in one minute or less. There are times the longest time it took me to help somebody get rid of one fear, 45 minutes. That's the longest time. Majority of the people we work with, one minute or less to get rid of any fear. Because we're dealing and we're teaching you how to deal with the root issues. Okay, well, that concludes our summary for removing the stone. And we are going to be breaking up. Um, Pastor Grace, Quinley, I don't know if we need to break up into six groups or not. And if we do, then Pauline can lead a six group. And, um, you know, we can separate Pauline and Yitney up. So, so I'll pass it back on to you and our team, you will get to know our team members. Uh, Pastor David Wong has done a lot. He's been incredible and he's trained quite a few in Malaysia as well. He's, he's my translator when I go to um, Malaysia because we do teaching in Chinese as well. And he translates for me in Chinese and he's really, really efficient in it. And he's one of our best practitioner. But Pastor Zach and Phoebe, they're newer, but they're doing a great job in it as well. Okay. And they all have some incredible testimonies. Of, they prayed for people and they've seen some amazing things happening in the transformation of lives. Folks, this removing the stone, it's not about getting people to be healed emotionally. No, 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 no. Removing the stones is helping people be released to have more righteousness and peace and joy and love and a greater purpose with power in their life so that we can live the kingdom life and advance the kingdom. Why is that so important? If you and I are not living the kingdom life, it's going to be very difficult for us to share it with people. Think about this. We can invite people to come to church. Come to church. You can have more love. You can have more peace. You can have more joy. Jesus will give it to you. But don't look at my life. 
it's broken. I don't have peace. I don't have love. I don't have joy. Very difficult to do that. But if we're living it and we have amazing, abundant life, if we have great relationship with our spouse, with our children, with our parents, and it's a part of who we are, it is so much easier for us to pass it on to people. All right. Thank you for this time. I'll pass it on to back to Dr. Grace and we'll go from there. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Simeon and the team. Thank you for a wonderful testimony. All right. So we will have six groups because uh, we have 40 over participants. Welcome back, everyone. I hope you all have a very fruitful and blessed session with all the facilitators. Okay. Um, well, like what Pastor Simeon has mentioned, this is just a summarized, summarized, summarized session. So, um, do you all, uh, can, can you all see the chat? The, the chat box, uh, actually Pastor Simeon did send in his, um, the website and the ministry website and the, and the teaching videos. We can't website. see it, could you resend it? Because okay. we were not there. Okay, so. We can't see it. So, Yep, thank you, Pastor Sumian. All right. Okay, so I pass the time to Pastor Sumian to conclude this session. Thank you so much, Dr. Grace. Okay, I did send out um, the ministry website, it's rackministry.com. If you're interested in the details of learning to remove stones, it's under our online training, releasing and removing stones. And we had some interesting questions in, in my breakout group. One of the question is, if we wanna learn more and grow more and be involved in this ministry, how do we do that? So you go to those videos and um, look through the videos. And then if you're still interested after that, uh, I really strongly recommend that for those of you who want more peace and joy and love for yourself and your family, contact one of us and um, my phone number or my uh, email address, I just send it, uh, Stella send it to everyone, the squan at rackministry.com. If you get in touch with me, I'll get you connected to our Malaysian team. You know, uh, Pastor David is in charge of our Malaysian team. And Pastor David, if you feel comfortable, you know, uh, maybe you can put your email address there and you can contact him. If you need prayer session and you want someone in Malaysia, Pastor David can help coordinate that for us and he'll get one of the team members to pray with you. Or if you already have the team members contact information, you can contact them directly. Or you can also go to our website as well uh, at rackministry.com and you can sign up online. Now, if you're interested in growing more so that you can minister to your families and your friends and people in your church and so on, go to the video, learn it. And then if you're serious about it, you contact me and or Pastor David and we will help you grow. You know, uh, Pauline and Yidme and Pastor Zach and Pastor Phoebe and Ryan and Janet and Dax and, and Pastor David Warren, they all have been ministering to people. Now, you did not get to hear all their testimonies, not only for them personally, but for them ministering to people. They have amazing testimonies. And so, and I have another good news for you. All our ministry is free. We don't ever charge anything. Okay. So that's pretty good news, um, especially for our current environment. People are losing jobs. People have lots of fear. People are worried about the COVID. Families are being broken and falling apart. 
And so we want to help restore these people. We have young people, you know, we have teenagers, we have people who now are uh, orphans and teenagers and uh, who are struggling. And so we want to be able to help minister to those people as well in the future. Well, I think that just concludes uh, our time. And I, I want us to close the time in prayer. And I'm going to ask Pastor David Wong to do that for us, if that's OK. Yeah, let's pray. Father, we thank you for this wonderful night that we can come together and share and learn and to walk in your ways. Lord, we thank you for all uh, the things that we have shared, all the testimonies that we have shared, and we thank you for all the angers that we have gathered off tonight. Lord, we just give you the glory. Lord, help us to be pure in front of you. Help us to have a fresh new heart so that we can choose the right path and we can walk in the kingdom and the power and we can be a blessing to many, Lord. So I uh, speak peace and blessings to everyone in the group, Lord. May your grace, your love, your joy fill everyone and their family. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. 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 And amen. By, amen. I wanted to say when you all came back and I saw the video of you, I really appreciate that because, you know, the first night, a couple of Saturdays ago when I was teaching, no video was turned on. I was like, who am I talking to? So really appreciate you guys having your videos on. And I hope more of you can do that if possible in the future. So we get to know one another a little bit. All right, Dr. Grace, back to you if there's anything else. Otherwise, we'll see you next week, right? I think that's all for tonight. <laughs> Thank you very much, Pastor Silvians and team. So I just want to mention that in the chat box, that is where the Facebook page is. If those who haven't registered yet, please do register so that we can have your email. So the, the teaching material and the recording will be sending the link to you all. So um, the, the video will, will usually um, uh, upload to the Facebook page that we have sent up the link to. Okay, all right. Thank you very oh, much, Dr. everyone. Grace. Dr. Grace, yes. I have one more thought. If you're a pastor or a leader of a ministry and you want this for your church, also let me know because I work with people, Pastor Zach and Pastor Phoebe, I started joining them a few months ago and helped raising them up. So we not only work with individuals, but we work with churches as well and ministries as well. Okay. All right, that's all. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night rest. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Good night.